John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 2, Chapter Number 8. We'll start here at the Sixth Commandment. Thou shalt not kill. 39. The purport of this commandment is that since the Lord has bound the whole human race by a kind of unity, the safety of all ought to be considered as instructed uh, to each, or as entrusted to each. In general, therefore, all violence and injustice and every kind of harm from which our neighbor's body suffers is prohibited. Accordingly, we are required faithfully to do what in us lies to defend the life of our neighbor, to promote whatever tends to his tranquility, to be vil vil uh, vigilant in warding off harm, and when danger comes, to assist in removing it. Remembering that the divine lawgiver thus speaks, consider, moreover, that he requires you to apply the same rule in regulating your mind. It were ridiculous that he who sees the thoughts of the heart and has special regard to them should train the body only to rectitude. This commandment, therefore, prohibits the murder of the heart and requires a sincere desire to preserve our brother's life. The hand, indeed, commits the murder, but the mind, under the influence of wrath and hatred, conceives it. How can you be angry with your brother without passionately longing to do him harm? If you must not be angry with him, neither must you hate him, hatred being nothing but inveterate anger. However, you may disguise the fact or endeavor to escape from it by vain pretexts, where either wrath or hatred is, there is an inclination to do mischief. If you still persist in uh, tergiversation, uh, the mouth of the Spirit has declared that whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. 1 John 3.15 And the mouth of our Savior has declared that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the, ju of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 5.22 40 Scripture notes a twofold equity on which this commandment is founded. Man is both the image of God and our flesh. Wherefore, if we would not violate the image of God, we must hold the person of man sacred. If we would not divest ourselves of humanity, we must cherish our own flesh. The practical inference to be drawn from the redemption and gift of Christ will be elsewhere considered. The Lord has been pleased to direct our attention to these two natural considerations as inducement, inducements to watch over our neighbor's preservation, to revere the divine image impressed upon him and embrace our own flesh. To be clear of the crime of murder, it is not enough to refrain from shedding man's blood. If an, in act you uh, perpetrate, if endeavor you plot, if in wish and design you conceive what is adverse to another's safety, you have the guilt of murder. On the other hand, if you do not, according to your means and opportunity, study to defend his safety, by that inhumanity you violate the law. But if the safety of the body is so carefully provided for, we may hence infer how much care and exertion is due to the safety of the soul, which is of immeasurably higher value in the sight of God. Seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The purport of uh, 41. The purport of this commandment is that as God loves chastity and purity, we ought to guard against all uncleanness. The substance of the commandment, therefore, is that we must not defile ourselves with any impurity or libidinous excess. To this corresponds the affirmative that we must regulate every part of our conduct chastely and contently. The thing expressly forbidden is adultery, to which lust naturally tends, that its filthiness, being of a grosser and more palpable form, inasmuch as it casts a stain even on the body, may di dispose us to abominate every form of lust. As the law under which man was created was not to lead a life of solitude, but enjoy a help meet for him, and ever since he fell under the curse, the necessity for this mode of life is increased. The Lord made the requisite provision for us in this respect by the institution of marriage, which entered into under his authority, he is also sanctified with his blessing. Hence it is evident that any mode of cohabitation different from marriage is cursed in his sight and that the conjugal relation was ordained as a necessary means of preventing us from giving way to unbridled lust. Let us beware, therefore, uh, of yielding to indulgence, seeing we are assured that the curse of God lies on every man and woman cohabitating without marriage. 42. Now, since natural feeling and the passions inflamed by the fall make the marriage tie doubly necessary, save in the case of those whom God has by special grace exempted, let every individual consider how the case stands uh, with himself. 
Virginity, I admit, is a virtue not to be despised, but since it is denied to some, and to others granted only for a season, those who are assailed by incontinence and unable successfully to war against it, should betake themselves to the remedy of marriage, and thus cultivate chastity in the way of their calling. Those incapable of self-restraint, if they apply not to the remedy allowed and provided for intemperance, war with God and resist his ordinance. And uh, let no man tell me, as many in the present day do, that he can do all things God helping. The help of God is present with those only who walk in his ways. Psalm 151, uh, sorry, Psalm 91, uh, verse 14. That is, in his calling, from which all withdraw themselves, who, omitting the remedies provided by God, vainly and presumptuously strive to struggle with and surmount their natural feelings. That uh, continence is a special gift from God and of the whole class of those which are not bestowed indiscriminately on the whole body of the church, but only on a few of its members, our Lord affirms. Matthew 19.12 He first describes a certain class of individuals who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. That is, in order that they may be able to devote themselves with more liberty and less restraint to the things of heaven. But lest anyone should suppose that such a sacrifice was in every man's power, he had shown a little before that all are not capable, but those only to whom it is specially given from above. Hence he concludes, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Paul asserts the same thing still more plainly when he says, Every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. 43. Since we are reminded by an express declaration that it is not in every man's power to live chaste in celibacy, although it may be his most strenuous study and aim to do so, that it is a special grace which the Lord bestows only on certain individuals, in order that they may be less encumbered in his service, do we not oppose God uh, and nature as constituted by him if we do not accommodate our mode of life to the measure of our ability? The Lord prohibits fornication, therefore he requires purity and chastity. Uh, chastity. The only method by uh, which each has of preserving it is to measure himself by his capacity. Let no man rashly despise matrimony as a thing useless or superfluous to him. Let no man long for celibacy unless he is able to despise, uh, or sorry, let no man long for celibacy unless he is able to dispense with the married state. Nor even here let him consult the tranquility or convenience of the flesh, save only that freed from this tie, he may be the readier and more prepared for all the offices of piety. And since there are many on whom this blessing is conferred only for a time, let every one in abstaining from marriage do it so long as he is fit to endure celibacy. If he has not the power of subduing his passion, let him understand that the Lord has made it obligatory on him to marry. The apostle shows this when he enjoins, and nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. If they cannot contain, let them marry. He first intimates that the greater part of men are liable to incontinence, and then of those so liable, he orders all without exception to have recourse to the only remedy by which unchastity may be obviated. The incontinent, therefore, in neglecting, the cure, in neglecting to cure their infirmity by this means, sin by the very circumstance of disobeying the apostle's command. And let not a man flatter himself that because he abstains from the outward act, he cannot be accused of unchastity. His mind may in the meantime be inwardly inflamed with lust. For Paul's definition of chastity is uh, purity of mind combined with purity of body. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and spirit. 1 Corinthians seven thirty four. Therefore, when he gives a reason for the former precept, he not only says that it is better to marry than to live in fornication, but that it, that it is better to marry than to burn. 44. Moreover, when spouses are made aware that their union is blessed by the Lord, they are thereby reminded that they must not give way to intemperate and unrestrained indulgence. For though honorable wedlock veils the turpitude of incontinence, it does not follow that it ought forthwith to become a stimulus to it. Wherefore, let spouses consider that all things are not lawful for them. Let them... Uh, let there be sobriety in the behavior of the husband toward the wife, and of the wife in her turn toward the husband, each so acting as not to do anything unbecoming the dignity and temperance of married life. Marriage contracted in the Lord ought to exhibit measure and modesty, not run to the extreme of wantonness. This excess Ambrose censored gravely, but not undeservedly when he described the man who shows no modesty or comeliness in conjugal intercourse as committing adultery with his wife. Lastly, let us consider who the lawgiver is that thus condemns fornication. Even he who, as he is entitled to possess us entirely, requires integrity of body, soul, and spirit. 
Therefore, while he forbids fornication, he at the same time forbids us to lay snares for our neighbor's chastity, by lascivious attire, obscene gestures, and impure conversation. There was reason in the remark made by uh, Archelaus to a youth clothed effeminately and over luxuriously that it mattered not in what part his wantonness appeared. We must have respect to God, who abhors all contamination, whatever be the part of the soul or body in which it appears, and that there may be no doubt about it. Let us remember that what the Lord here commends is chastity. If he requires chastity, he condemns everything which is opposed to it. Therefore, if you, ascribe, if you aspire to obedience, let not your mind burn within with evil concupiscence, your eyes wanton after corrupting objects, nor your body be decked for allurement. Let neither your tongue be filthy spe by filthy speeches, nor your appetite by intemperance entice the mind to corresponding thoughts. All vices of this description are a kind of stains which despoil chastity of its purity. Eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. The purport is that in justice being an abomination to God, we must render to every man his due. In substance, then, the commandment forbids us to long after other men's goods, and accordingly requires every man to exert himself honestly in preserving his own. For he must consider that what each individual possesses has not fallen to him by chance, but by the distribution of the sovereign Lord of all, that no one can pervert his means to bad purposes without committing a fraud on a divine dispensation. There are very many kinds of theft. One consists in violence, as when a man's goods are forcibly plundered and carried off, another in malicious imposture, as when they are fraudulently intercepted, a third in the more hidden craft which takes possession of them with a semblance of justice, and a fourth in syncophancy, syncophancy which uh, wiles them away under the pretense of donation. But not to dwell too long in enumerating the different classes, we know that all the arts by which we obtain possession of the goods and money of our neighbors for sincere affection, substituting an eagerness to deceive or injure them in any way, are to be regarded as thefts. Though they may be obtained by an action at law, a different decision is given by God. He sees the long train of deception by which the man of craft begins to lay nets for his more simple neighbor, until he entangles him in its meshes, sees the harsh and cruel laws by which the more powerful oppresses and crushes the feeble, sees the enticements by which the more wily baits the hook for the less wary, though uh, all these escape the judgment of man, and no uh, cognizance is taken of them. Nor is the violation of this commandment confined to money, or merchandise, or lands, but extends to every kind of right. For we defraud our neighbors to their hurt if we decline any of the duties which we are bound to perform towards them. If an agent or an indolent steward wastes the substance of his employer, or does not give due heed to the management of his property, if he unjustly squanders or luxur luxuriously wastes, the means entrusted to him, if a servant holds his master in derision, divulges his secrets, or in any way is treacherous to his life or his goods, if on the other hand a master cruelly torments his household, he is guilty of theft before God, since every one who in the exercise of his calling performs not what he owes to others, keeps back or makes away with what does not belong to him. 46. This commandment, therefore, we shall duly obey, if, contented with our own lot, we study to acquire nothing but honest and lawful gain. If we long not to grow rich by injustice, nor to plunder our neighbor of his goods, that our own may thereby be increased, if we hasten not to heap up wealth cruelly wrung from the blood of others, if we do not by means lawful and unlawful, with excessive eagerness, uh, scrap uh, together whatever may glut our avarice or meet our uh, prodigal prodigality. On the other hand, let it be our constant aim faithfully to lend our counsel and aid to all so as to assist them in retaining their property. Or if we have to do with the perfidious or crafty, let us rather be prepared to yield somewhat of our right than to contend with them. And not only so, but let us con contribute to the relief of those whom we see under the pressure of difficulties, assisting their want out of our abundance. Lastly, let each of us consider how far he is bound in duty to others, and in good faith pay what we owe. In the same way, let the people pay all due honor to their rulers, submit patiently to their authority, obey their laws and orders, and decline nothing which they can bear without sacrificing the favor of God. Let rulers again take due charge of their people, preserve the public peace, protect the good, curb the bad, and conduct themselves throughout as those who must render an account of their office to God, the judge of all. Let the ministers of churches faithfully give heed to the ministry of the word and not corrupt the doctrine of salvation, but deliver it purely and sincerely to the people of God. 
Let them teach not merely by doctrine, but by example. In short, let them act the part of good shepherds towards the flo their flocks. Let the people in turn, or let the people in their turn, receive them as the messengers and apostles of God. Render them the honor which their supreme master has bestowed on them, and supply them with such things as are necessary for their livelihood. Let parents be careful to bring up, guide, and teach their children as a trust committed to them by God. Let them not exacerbate or exasperate or alienate them by cruelty, but cherish and embrace them with the lenity, uh, lenity and indulgence which becomes their character. The regard due to parents from their children has already been adverted to. Let the young respect those advancing years, as the Lord has been pleased to make that age honorable. Let the aged also, by their prudence and their experience, in which they are far superior, guide the feebleness of youth, not assailing them with harsh and clamorous invectives, but tempering strictness with ease and affability. Let servants show themselves diligent and respectful in obeying their masters, and this not with eye servants, but from the heart as the servants of God. Let masters also not be stern and disobliging to their servants, nor harass them with excessive asperity, nor treat them with insult, but rather let them acknowledge them as brethren and fellow servants of our heavenly master, whom, therefore, they are bound to treat with mutual love and kindness. Let everyone, I say, thus consider what in his own place and order he owes to his neighbors, and pay what he owes. Moreover, we must always have a reference to the lawgiver, and so remember that the law requires us to promote and defend the interest and convenience of our fellow men, applies equally to our minds and our hands. Ninth Commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. 47. The purport of, this command, of, the, purport of the commandment is, since God, who is truth, abhors falsehood, we must cultivate unfeigned truth towards each other. The sum, therefore, will be that we must not by uh, calumnies and false accusations injure our neighbor's name, or by falsehood impair his fortunes. In fine, that we must not injure any one from petulance or a love of evil speaking. To this prohibition corresponds the command that we must faithfully assist everyone as far as in us lies in asserting the truth for the maintenance of his good name and his estate. The Lord seems to have intended to explain the commandment in these words. Thou shalt not raise a false report, put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Keep thee far from a false matter. Exodus 23, 1 and 7. In another passage, he not only prohibits that species of falsehood which consists in acting the part of talebearers among the people, but says, Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. Leviticus 19.16 Both transgressions are distinctly prohibited. Indeed, there can be no doubt that as in the previous commandment he prohibited cruelty, unchastity, and avarice, so here he prohibits falsehood, which consists of the two parts to which we have adverted. By malignant or vicious detraction, we sin against our neighbor's good name. By lying, sometimes even by casting a slur upon him, we injure him in his estate. It makes no difference whether you suppose that formal and judicial testimony is here intended, or the ordinary testimony which is given in private conversation. For we must always recur to the consideration that for each kind of transgression, one species is set forth by way of example that to it the others may be referred, and that the species chiefly selected is that in which the turpitude of the transgression is most apparent. It seems proper, however, to extend it more generally to calumny and sinister insinuations by which our neighbors are unjustly uh, aggrieved. For falsehood in a court of justice is always accompanied with perjury, but against perjury, in so far as it profanes and violates the name of God, there is a sufficient provision in the third commandment, Hence, the legitimate observance of this precept consists in, in employing the tongue in the maintenance of truth, so as to promote both the good name and the prosperity of our neighbor. The equity of this is perfectly clear. For if a good name is more precious than riches, a man, in being robbed of his good name, is no less injured than if he were robbed of his goods, while in the latter case, false testimony is sometimes not less injurious than a rampine committed by the hand. 48. And yet it is strange with what supine security men everywhere sin in this respect. Indeed, very few are found who do not notoriously labor under this disease. Such is the envenomed delight we take both in prying into and exposing our neighbor's faults. Let us not imagine that let us not imagine it is a sufficient excuse to say that on many occasions our statements are not false. He who forbids us to defame our neighbor's reputation by falsehood desires us to keep it untarnished in so far as truth will permit. Though the commandment is only directed against falsehood, it intimates that the preservation of our neighbor's good name 
is recommended. It ought to be a sufficient inducement to us to guard our neighbor's good name that God takes an interest in it. Wherefore, evil speaking in general is undoubtedly condemned. Moreover, by evil speaking, we understand not the rebuke which is administered with a view of correcting, not accusation or judicial decision by which evil is sought to be remedied, not public censure which tends to strike terror into other offenders, not the disclosure made to those whose safety depends on being forewarned, lest unawares they should be brought into danger, but the odious crimination which springs from a malicious and petulant love of slander. Nay, the commandment extends so far as to include that scurrilous affected urbanity uh, instinct with invective, by which the failings of others under an appearance of sportiveness are bitterly assailed, as some are wont to do, who court the praise of wit, though it should be uh, called forth a blush or inflict a bitter pang. By petulance of this description, our brethren are sometimes grievously wounded. But if we turn our eye to the lawgiver, whose just authority extends over the ears and the mind, as well as the tongue, we cannot fail to perceive that eagerness to listen to slander and an unbecoming proneness to censorious judgment are here forbidden. It were absurd to suppose that God hates the disease of evil speaking in the tongue, and yet disapproves not of its malignity in the mind. Wherefore, if the true fear of and love of God dwell in us, we must endeavor as far as is lawful and expedient, and as far as charity admits, neither to listen nor give utterance to bitter and acrimonious charges, nor rashly entertain sinister suspicions. As just interpreters of the words and actions of other men, let us candidly maintain the honor due to them by our judgment, our ear, and our tongue. Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The purport is, since the Lord would have the whole soul pervaded with love, any feeling of an adverse nature must be banished from our minds. The sum, therefore, will be that no thought be permitted to insinuate itself into our minds and inflame them with a noxious concupiscence tending to our neighbor's loss. To this corresponds the contrary precept, that everything which we conceive, deliberate, will, or design be conjoined with the good and advantage of our neighbor. But here it seems we are met with a great and perplexing difficulty. For if it was correctly said above that under the words adultery and theft, lust and an intention to injure and deceive are prohibited, it may seem superfluous afterwards to employ a separate commandment to prohibit a covetous desire of our neighbor's goods. The difficulty will easily be removed by distinguishing between design and covetousness. Design, such as we have spoken of in the previous commandments, is a deliberate consent of the will after passion has taken possession of the mind. Covetousness may exist without such deliberation and assent, when the mind is only stimulated and tickled by uh, vain and perverse objects, as therefore the Lord previously ordered that charity should regulate our wishes, studies, and actions, so he now orders us to regulate the thoughts of the mind in the same way that none of them may be depraved and distorted, so as to give the mind a contrary bent. Having forbidden us to turn and incline our mind to wrath, hatred, adultery, theft, and falsehood, he now forbids us to give our thoughts the same direction. 50. Nor is such rectitude demanded without reason, for who can deny the propriety of occupying all the powers of the mind with charity? If it ceases to have charity for its aim, who can question that it is diseased? How comes it that so many desires of a, na uh, of a nature hurtful to your brother enter your mind, but just because, disregarding him, you think only of yourself? Were uh, your mind wholly endued with charity, no portion of it would remain for the entrance of such thoughts. In so far, therefore, as the mind is devoid of charity, it must be under the influence of concupiscence. Someone will object that those fancies will uh, casually rise up in the mind and forthwith vanish away cannot properly be condemned as concupiscences which have their seat in the heart. I answer that the question here relates to a description of fancies which, while they present themselves to our thoughts, at the same time impress and stimulate the mind with cupidity. Since the mind never thinks of making some choice, but the heart is excited and tends towards it. God therefore commands a strong, ardent affection, and affection not to be impeded by any portion, however minute, of concupiscence. He requires a mind so admi uh, admirably 
arranged as not to be prompted in the slightest degree contrary to the law of love. Lest you should imagine that this view is not supported by any grave authority, I may mention that it was first suggested to me by Augustine. But although it was the uh, intention of God to prohibit every kind of perverse desire, he, by the way of example, sets uh, before us those objects which are generally regarded as most attractive, thus leaving no room for cupidity of any kind by the interdiction of those things in which it especially delights and loves to revel. Such, then, is the second table of the law, in which we are sufficiently instructed in the duties which we owe to man for the sake of God, on a consideration of whose nature the whole system of love is founded. It were vain, therefore, to inculcate the various duties taught in this table without placing your instructions on the fear and reverence to God as their proper foundation. I need not tell the considerate reader that those who make two precepts out of the prohibition of covetousness perversely split one thing into two. There is nothing in the repetition of the words, Thou shalt not covet. The house being first put down, its different parts are afterwards enumerated, beginning with the wife, and hence it is clear that the whole ought to be read consecutively, as is properly done by the Jews. The sum of the whole commandment, therefore, is that whatever each individual possesses remain entire and secure, not only from injury or the wish to injure, but also from the slightest feeling of covetousness which can spring up in the mind. 51. It will not now be difficult to ascertain the general end can contemplated by the whole law, the fulfillment of righteousness that man may from his life may form his life on the model of the divine purity. For therein God has so delineated his own character that any one exhibiting in action what is commanded would in some measure exhibit a living image of God. Wherefore Moses, when he wished to fix a summary of the whole law in the memory of the Israelites, thus addressed them. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Deuteronomy ten, twelve, and 13. And he ceased not to reiterate the same thing, whenever he had occasion to mention the end of the law. To this, the doctrine of the law pays so much regard that it connects man by holiness of life with his God. And as Moses elsewhere expresses it, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 5, and 9, uh, 11, verse 13, and makes him cleave to it, or makes him cleave to him. Moreover, this holiness of life is comprehended under the two heads above mentioned. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. First, our mind must be completely filled with love to God, and then this love must forthwith flow out toward our neighbor. This the apostle shows when he says the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. 1 Timothy 1, five. You see that conscience and faith unfeigned are placed at the head. In other words, true piety and that from the, this charity is derived. It is a mistake then to suppose that merely the rudiments and first principles of righteousness are delivered in the law to form, as it were, a kind of introduction to good works and not to guide to the perfect performance of them. For complete perfection, nothing more can be required than is expressed in these passages of Moses and Paul. How far, pray, would he wish to go who is not satisfied with the instruction which directs man to the fear of God, to spiritual worship, practical obedience, in fine purity of conscience, faith unfeigned, and charity? This confirms that uh, interpretation of the law which searches out and finds in its precepts all the duties of piety and charity. Those who merely search for dry and meager elements, as if it taught the will of God only by halves, by no means understand its end, the apostle being witness. 52. As in giving a summary of the law, Christ and the apostles sometimes omit the first table. Very many fall into the mistake of supposing that their words apply to both tables. In Matthew, Christ calls judgment, mercy, and faith, the weightier matters of the law. I think it clear that by faith is here meant veracity towards men. But in order to extend the words to the whole law, some take it for piety towards God. This is surely uh, to no purpose, for Christ is speaking of those works by which a man ought to approve himself as just. If we attend to this, we will cease to wonder why elsewhere, when asked by the young man, what good thing shall I do that I may have inter eternal life? He simply answers that he must keep the commandments. Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Matthew nineteen sixteen and 18. 
For the obedience of the first table consisted almost entirely either in the internal affection of the heart or in ceremonies. The affection of the heart was not visible, and hypocrites were diligent in the observance of ceremonies. But the works of charity were of such a nature as to be a solid attestation of righteousness. The same thing occurs so frequently in the prophets that it must be familiar to everyone who has any tolerable acquaintance with them. For almost on every occasion, when they exhort men to repentance, omitting the first table, they insist on faith, judgment, mercy, and equity. Nor do, they in this, nor do they in this way omit the fear of God. They only require a serious proof of it from its signs. It is well known, indeed, that when they treat of the law, they generally insist on the second table, because therein the cultivation of righteousness and integrity is best manifested. There is no occasion to quote passages. Everyone can easily for himself perceive the truth of my observation. 53. Is it then true, you will ask, that it is a more complete summary of righteousness to live innocently with men than piously towards God? By no means. But because no man, as a matter of course, uh, observes charity in all respects, unless he seriously fear God, such observance is, is a proof of piety also. To this we may add that the Lord, well knowing that none of our good deeds can reach him, as the psalmist declares in Psalm uh, 16.2, does not demand from us duties towards himself, but exercises us in good works towards our neighbor. Hence the apostle, not without cause, makes the whole perfection of the saints to consist in charity. Ephesians 3.19 and Colossians 3.14. And in another passage, he not improperly calls it the fulfilling of the law, adding that he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Romans 8.8. 8. And again, all the laws fulfilled in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Galatians 5.14. For this is the very thing which Christ himself teaches when he says, All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Matthew seven twelve. It is certain that in the law and the prophets, faith and whatever pertains to the due worship of God holds the first, first place, and that to this charity is made subordinate. But our Lord means that in the law the observance of justice and equity towards men is prescribed as the means which we are to employ in testifying a pious fear of God, if we truly possess it. 54. Let us therefore hold that our life will be framed in best accordance with the will of God and the requirements of his law, when it is, in every respect, most advantageous to our brethren. But in the whole law, there is not one syllable which lays down a rule as to what man is to do or avoid for the advantage of his own carnal nature. And indeed, since men are naturally prone to excessive self-love, which they always retain, how great soever their departure from the truth may be, there was no need of a law to inflame a love already existing in excess. Hence it is perfectly plain that the observance of the commandments consists not in the love of ourselves, but in the love of God and our neighbor, and that he leads the best and holiest life who, as little as may be, studies and lives for himself, and that none lives worse and more unrighteously than he who studies and lives only for himself, and seeks and thinks only of his own. Nay, the better to express how strongly we should be inclined to love our neighbor. The Lord has made self-love, as it were, the standard, there being no feeling in our nature of greater strength and vehemence. The force of the expression ought to be carefully weighed, for he does not, as some sophists have stupidly dreamed, assign the first place to self-love and the second to charity. He rather transfers to others the love which we naturally feel for ourselves. Hence the apostle declares that charity seeketh not her own, 1 Corinthians 13.5. Nor is the argument worth a straw that the thing regulated must always be inferior to the rule. The Lord did not make self-love the rule, as if love towards others was subordinate to it, but whereas through natural pravity the feeling of love usually rests on ourselves, he shows that it ought to diffuse itself in another direction, that we should be prepared to do good to our neighbor with no less alacrity, ardor, and solicitude than to ourselves. 55. Our Savior, having shown in the parable of the Samaritan, Luke 5.36, that the term neighbor comprehends the most remote stranger, there is no reason for limiting the precept of love to our own connections. I deny not that the closer the relation, the more frequent our offices of kindness should be. For the condition of humanity requires that there be more duties in common between those who are more nearly connected by the ties of relationship or friendship or neighborhood. And this is done without any offense to God, by whose providence we are in a manner impelled to do it. But I say that the whole human race, without exception, are to be embraced with one feeling of charity, that here there is no distinction of Greek or barbarian, worthy or unworthy, friend or foe, since all are to be viewed not in themselves but in God. If we turn aside from this view, there is no wonder that we entangle ourselves in error. 
Wherefore, if we would hold the true course in love, our first step must be to turn our eyes not to man, the sight of whom might oftener produce hatred than love, but to God, who requires that the love which we bear to him be diffused among all mankind, so that our fundamental principle must ever be, let a man be what he may, he is still to be loved, because God is love. 56. Wherefore, nothing could be more uh, pestential than the ignorance or wickedness of the schoolmen in converting the precepts respecting revenge and the love of enemies, precepts which had formerly been delivered to all the Jews and were then delivered universally to all Christians, into councils which it was free to obey or disobey, confining the necessary observance of them to the monks, who were made more righteous than ordinary Christians by the simple circumstance of voluntary binding themselves to obey councils. The reason they assigned for not receiving them as laws is that they seem too heavy and burdensome, especially to Christians who are, not, who are under the law of grace. Have they, indeed, the hardihood to remodel the eternal law of God concerning the love of our neighbor? Is there a page of the law in which any such distinction exists? Or rather, do we not meet in every page with, with commands which, in the strictest terms, require us to love our enemies? What is meant by commanding us to feed our enemy if he is hungry? to bring back his ox or his ass if we meet it going astray, or help it up if we see it lying under its burden. Proverbs 25.21 and Exodus 23.4 Shall we show kindness to cattle for man's sake and have no feeling of good will to himself? What? Is not the word of the Lord eternally true? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Deuteronomy 32.35 This is elsewhere more explicitly stated, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Leviticus 19.18 let them either erase these passages from the law or let them acknowledge the Lord as a lawgiver, nor not falsely feign him to be merely a counselor. 57. And what pray is meant by the following passage, which they have dared to insult with this absurd gloss? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Matthew five forty four and 45. Who does not here concur in the reasoning of Christostom? That the nature of the motive makes it plain, that these are not exhortations, but precepts. For what is left to us if we are excluded from the number of the children of God? According to the schoolmen, monks alone will be the children of our Father in heaven. Monks alone will dare to invoke God as their Father. And in the meantime, how will it fare with the church? By the same rule, she will be confined to heathens and publicans. For our Savior says, If ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. It will truly be well with us if we are left only the name of Christians, while we are deprived of the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. Nor is the argument of Augustine less forcible. When the Lord forbids adultery, he forbids it in regard to the wife of a foe, not less than the wife of a friend. When he forbids theft, he does not allow stealing of any description, whether from a friend or an enemy. Now these two commandments, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, Paul brings under the rule of love. Nay, he says that they are briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Romans 9.9. 9. Or sorry, Romans 8.9. Therefore Paul must either be a false interpreter of the law, and sorry, that's actually Romans 13.9. Therefore Paul must either be a false interpreter of the law, or we must necessarily conclude that under this precept we are bound to love our enemies just as our friends. Those then show themselves to be in truth the children of Satan, who thus licentiously shake off a yoke common to the children of God. It may be doubled, or it may be doubted, whether in promulgating this dogma they have displayed greater stupidity or impudence. There is no ancient writer who does not hold it as certain that these are pure precepts. It was not even doubted in the age of Gregory, as is plain from his decided assertion, for he holds it to be incontrovertible that they are precepts. And how stupidly they argue. The burden, say they, were too difficult for Christians to bear. As if anything could be imagined more difficult than to love the Lord with all thy heart, soul, and strength. Compared uh, with this law, there is none which may not seem easy, whether it be to love our enemy or to banish every feeling of revenge from our minds. To our weakness, indeed, everything even to the minutest tittle of the law is arduous and difficult. In the Lord we have strength. It is his to give what he orders, and to order what he wills. That Christians are under the law of grace means not that they are to wander unrestrained without law, but that they are engrafted into Christ, by whose grace they are freed from the curse of the law, and by whose spirit they have the law written in their hearts. This grace Paul has termed, but not in the proper sense of the term a law, alluding to the law of God, with 
which he was contrasting it. The schoolmen laying hold on the term law make it the groundwork of their vain speculations. 58. The same must be said of their application of the term venial sin, both to the hidden impiety which violates the first table and the direct transgression of the last commandment of the second table. They define venial sin to be desire unaccompanied with deliberate assent and not remaining long in the heart. But I maintain that it cannot even enter the heart unless through a want of those things which are required in the law. We are forbidden to have strange gods. When the mind under the influence of distrust looks elsewhere, or is seized with some sudden desire to transfer its blessedness to some other quarter, whence are these movements, however evanescent, but just because there is some empty corner in the soul to receive such temptations? And not to lengthen out the discussion, there is a precept to love God with the whole heart and mind and soul, and therefore if all the powers of the soul are not directed to the love of God, there is a departure from the obedience of the law." Because those internal enemies which rise up against the dominion of God and countermand his edicts prove that his throne is not well established in our consciences. It has been shown that the last commandment goes to this extent. Has some undue longing sprung up in our mind? Then we are chargeable with covetousness and stand convicted as transgressors of the law. For the law forbids us not only to meditate and plan our neighbor's loss, but to be stimulated and inflamed with covetousness. But every transgression of the law lays us under the curse, and therefore even the slightest desires cannot be exempted from the fatal sentence. In weighing our sins, says Augustine, let us not use a deceitful balance, weighing at our own discretion, what we will and how we will, calling this heavy and that light, but let us use the divine balance of the Holy Scripture, as taken from the treasury of the Lord, and by it weigh every offense, nay, not weigh, but rather recognize what has been already weighed by the Lord. And what saith the scripture? Certainly when Paul says that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, he shows that he knew nothing of this vile distinction. As we are but too prone to hypocrisy, there was very little occasion for this sop to soothe our torpid consciences. 59. I wish they would consider what our Savior meant when he said, Whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.19. Are they not of this number, when they presume to extenuate this transgression of the law, as if it were unworthy of death? The proper course had been to consider not simply what it command, what is commanded, but who it is that commands, because every least transgression of his law derogates from his authority. Do they count it a small matter to insult the majesty of God in any one respect? Again, since God has explained his will in the law, everything contrary to the law is displeasing to him. Will they feign that the wrath of God is so disarmed that the punishment of death will not forthwith follow upon it? He has declared plainly, if they could be induced to listen to his voice, instead of darkening his clear truth by their insipid subtleties, the soul that sent it, it shall die. Ezekiel 28 and verse 20. Again in the passage lately quoted, the wages of sin is death. What these men acknowledge to be sin because they are unable to deny it, they contend is not mortal. Having already indulged this madness too long, let them learn to repent. For if they persist in their infatuation, taking no further notice of them, let the children of God remember that all sin is mortal, because it is rebellion against the will of God, and necessarily provokes his anger. And because it is a violation of the law, against every violation of which, without exception, the judgment of God has been pronounced, the faults of the saints are indeed venial, not, however, in their own nature, but because through the mercy of God they obtain pardon. End of chapter 8.